John Carney, Martin Kilcoyne, all coming your way in uh, just a bit. Professor Roger Goldman is Professor Emeritus at St. Louis University School of Law. Joins us here in studio. Good morning, Roger Goldman. Happy to be here. You you are you're a professor. Clearly, you're smart. You're also uh, smart because you thought you were late. You were not late. And here's a little piece of broadcasting advice for you. Straight from Jack Buck. You ready? Shoot. Never rush to a microphone. Makes sense. I'll remember next time. You got it. Good. Because you, you don't want to be out of breath. Got it. Are you out of breath? No, no. I'm yeah, a good Yeah, shape. you're good. Yeah, you, you 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 sauntered into the studio. Um, we're here. We're, we're glad you're, you're here and uh, settled in um, because um, we wanted to sort of talk about uh, police use of force. Uh, everyone, it's clearly in the news. Um, what's accessible force? What isn't accessible force? Um, you know, what should be done? What shouldn't be done? And it's sort of because of last night's shooting. Now, you know, shootings is back into the news. We have random drive-by shootings all the time. It's not even news anymore. So we wanted to bring you in to sort of talk about some of this. First of all, as you watch this Ferguson story develop, what are your thoughts as you, you watch this? Well, starting from the beginning, the incident involving Michael Brown was uh, what got me very interested. I, I have been teaching uh, for many, many years uh, criminal procedure, um, particularly focused on police practices. And uh, the main issue that arises in a potential lawsuit here with the officer is whether excessive force was used in his confrontation and ultimate use of deadly force towards Michael Brown. But it's an impossible question to answer because excessive force for the mother or for Michael Brown might be a different standard than excessive force for the police chief or the prosecuting attorney. True, but the, the, the legal issue, if it, you know, after all the facts are determined, it's going to turn on whether or not the constitutional rights of Michael Brown were used by the use of force by the unnamed officer. If I say a word the FCC says I'm not allowed to say, I get fired, I might get fined. If Michael, if the officer shoots someone and it turns out that it's wrong, can he be charged with murder? So you've raised a, one of the very many intriguing questions here. The answer is he could be charged with murder in state court, but the only way you could get him in a federal criminal prosecution is if there was proof that he violated Michael Brown's constitutional rights, specifically in this case, the Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, it seems like, well, I, I, and again, speculation, I, I, I don't want to speculate, but there are people saying he should be charged with murder. Police don't have a protection. I mean, if 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 a police officer murders his wife in, in a lover's quarrel, that's different. Then here's a man on the job doing his duty. Let's say he used too much force. Let's say the, the police, officer, police officer turns out to be wrong. Um, he can be charged with murder because, I mean, is there, when you say his, his civil rights were violated, well, clearly his civil rights were violated if he was shot inappropriately. Well, no. We're talking now about in order to prove a federal constitutional case, you do know the FBI is involved in this. Right. And the two options would be for uh, Prosecutor McCullough to bring state charges of murder, mm -hmm. which was your first question. But the only way the feds could get involved in this would be to show that he intentionally violated Michael Brown's Fourth Amendment rights, which protects us all from unreasonable searches and seizures. And so there are two parallel tracks, kind of like the Rodney King case, state, federal. But there's no protection of a police officer while he's on the job. Well, yes, there is. Uh, for example... You gave the example of shooting his wife off duty. Right. And then you went to the next question, well, he was on the job. But let's suppose on the job, he just got angry. He didn't like Michael Brown, and he shot him in the head. Mm -hmm. That would be murder, even though it was, quote, on the job. Now, that's not this case right. uh, at this point. Uh, but, but trying to sort off is between murder state charges and federal constitutional violations Two separate charges, hard to split those two things off, but I do think your your listeners ought to know that there are parallel tracks that could be down the road followed in this case. Let's let's take the hypotheticals out of uh, Ferguson so we can sort of talk more freely about this. We often hear 
Uh, police officers say, I thought he had a gun. That's why I shot him. Turns out he didn't have a gun. Right? That's the, that's the, that's the scariest moment in a police officer's life. Oh, my goodness. I thought he had a gun. It turned out it was a toy gun. It turned out it was a cell phone, whatever it was. In those instances, um, is he protected because he really thought he had a gun? Absolutely. There have been several cases, especially in New York. Now, the intriguing thing about this case is everybody knows, my understanding is, that Michael Brown, when he left that car, did not have a gun. Right. That's not this case. On the other hand, there's claims, there's disputes here on what exactly happened. If, in fact, he went for the officer, which is what I understand the police chief's statement is, to reach for the gun, and then the officer shot him, uh, that's going to be, uh, you'll never prove a criminal case. On the other hand, if he just got angry at Brown, and then the story from the other side is Brown was uh, pulled in by his neck into the car, there was a scuffle, was the scuffle, the officer pulling a gun on him, that's the tricky case. That's the, that's the, that's the ambiguity that we have. How confident are you that we'll actually find out the real facts of this one? Well, said and done? one of the problems is, unlike other uh, uh, cities, perhaps the county itself would require videotape. I'm not sure. You know, many cities are going to that. Right. And by the way, these videotapes uh, and cameras on the police tend to be something that helps resolve these issues because right. false claims can be discovered. That wasn't the case here. We have a victim who's no longer there. Uh, we do have an eyewitness uh, who has different versions of it. Uh, this is one reason why it's going to take so long to sort it out, because there may be other witnesses. There may be other witnesses with cell phones. But I, I, I would want to get to the question of, was it legitimate to shoot Michael Brown if he was fleeing from the officer? We haven't really talked about that. There are a few Supreme Court cases that deal with that issue. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about the cameras for, for a second. Because I was talking about this with uh, Jim Bohannon last, last night on his uh, syndicated program. Um, the cameras were not installed in the vehicle. They're in a, in a box waiting to be installed in, in Ferguson. Um, but even if the camera is showing straight ahead, it sounds like all the activity took place on the side of the car. So even if it had a camera, we might not have captured what actually what happened. Correct. And my understanding, at least in some cities, it isn't just in the car, but it's also somehow attached to the police officer himself. I mean, this is developing technology. And I do think down the road it's going to be standard equipment procedure one of the things is being said as you mentioned he was running away from the police vehicle with his hands up how can it be justifiable with his hands up running away from a police vehicle well that's going to be the issue of whether the force the second use of force i mean the first question is what about the shot that hit him in the arm in the vehicle Secondly, though, what about his running away? My understanding is there were eight bullets. He shot once. He turned around, held the hands up. That's, if I were a federal prosecutor, that would be certainly indication that, look, the whole reason you're shooting a person in this is to prevent the escape. Once he stopped, once he's held his hands up, maybe the first shot was legitimate, maybe the second, although there's questions about that. But you wouldn't think that the third through the eighth would be. Right. Um, but there have been stories upon stories where police officers have said he it looked like he had a gun right it looked like he went for he was in his pocket it was in his wallet oh my goodness it turns around it's not his gun and and, and that's a very that's one of those where it could be very real and that could be an excuse no doubt about it in the diallo case the um, there are some cases in new york where they reaching for the gun will turn out to be the wallet in this case so far it appears that it's admitted that he was unarmed. Now, if that's going to come up that we thought he was unarmed, that's a different story. But even if somebody were unarmed, unarmed and running away, in theory you could say, but he might be dangerous to others if, in fact, it turns out he assaulted that police officer. There are only there's very few Supreme Court cases on this topic. One of them, actually the most important case, came out of St. Louis, uh, decided by the Eighth Circuit that we can talk about. How long ago was that? That was about five years prior to the famous Tennessee versus Garner case, the first of the Supreme Court escaping cases. They actually cited that Eighth Circuit case involving a fleeing felon, because it used to be in Missouri, you could shoot a fleeing felon even if he was unarmed and even if there was no fear for your own life.
And that's still true today? No, that was overturned by this Tennessee case, by this very famous case of Garner, 1985, that really is going to determine, that's the case, if it reaches the higher level courts, will be determined, was this legitimate use of trying to escape a da- of a dangerous person trying to escape. Professor Roger Gro- uh, Roger Goldman is our guest. He's professor emeritus at St. Louis University School of uh, Law. Um, do you want to stick around for another segment? I'm here. You got it. Uh, 920 here, Big 553 here, Big 550 KTRS. Uh, professor Roger Goldman is a professor emeritus at St. Louis University School of Law. We're talking about the legality of um, police using force, in arrests and so on and and so forth. What do you think? Do you wh- where can this case go? I mean, what do you think happens with this case? I know we don't have the facts, but uh, if they charged him, I mean, does this have a chance to go all the way to the Supreme Court? I, I guess, in a sense, or or is it just too early to ask that? Well, question? again, that gets back to something we talked about earlier. If it's a state case of murder, you know, McCullough prosecutes strictly in the state case. There, uh, unless there's some federal issue raised, that won't get to the Supreme Court. Right. The, the 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 way it could get the Supreme Court is um, on this issue we talked about a little bit earlier, which is when is legitimate to use force for a, quote, person who is fleeing and dangerous? Because the one case that got the Supreme Court on this, it was clear. It was a nighttime burglary. It was a slight, a fellow who broke in. It was admitted he was not armed, and they shot and killed him. That's when the court overturned this fleeing felon rule. And they came up with a new one that said you may only use deadly force without violating the Fourth Amendment, if the person is dangerous to others, it, they look at the severity of the crime. Uh, and in this case, with what we know about the Brown, it's a little bit ambiguous. We don't know what the facts are going to be right. uh, when he ran away. If he ran away, he could have been running away not because of uh, he was trying to escape. It's an impossible standard, though, Professor. Not, 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 but just thinking, thinking it's, it's, a, pr- it's, 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 it's impossible because... because the officer might think this guy's dangerous, and the kid's like, "I'm not dangerous." So, you know, in the officer's mind, it's almost like the the stand your ground rule in Florida. If if you're threatened, you have a right. Well, you might be threatened, and I might not be threatened. It's an impossible standard. Okay, peeling back the onion a little more, the question is: Is it a subjective view of the particular officer, or is it would an objectively reasonable officer have acted in this way? And the Supreme Court has not really resolved that one either. Um, uh, so, uh, again, these are incredibly complex ca- uh, uh, cases dependent on the particular facts. And unfortunately, we're talking about this without really know w- what the facts, how the facts are going to develop. Right. Um, the officer's name has come into question. Many people in the community want his name to be released. Is there any legalese, legalities, any reason why it should or shouldn't be released? My understanding is, and this isn't federal constitutional law, it's state practice that they do release typically within 72 hours. Now, the claim, of course, by I think the St. Louis County uh, chief uh, is that there have there are credible threats that the officer, if the name were released, would be under uh, attack. Right. Uh, so that's still to be resolved. And so when will his, they've, they, they've said his name will come out when, under the Freedom of Information, we have to actually release it, right? Well, what will happen will be, uh, my guess is the practice is if he's charged at that point, it's gonna, that's when his name's going to come out. And if he's not charged, we might never know. Uh, that's, you know, at least as far as, you know, I'm not expert on state law on this, but that's possible. He's yeah. never charged. Yeah. Uh, what are you waiting to see? What are you What are you watching to see with all this? Well, it's going to take a while for the facts to develop. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the feds get more involved in this uh, for different reasons, which is, you know, we're a community that's uh, getting get national news. The longer we delay things, uh, I think you need firm uh, decision on yes, and Obama came in on it yesterday. The feds are going to take this over. We need to calm things down, and as long as things are not out in the open, I think things could, you know, continue to escalate. Does a does a police officer in this situation have more rights than a citizen? In other words, if if I walk out of the studio and I'm mugged and I feel threatened, can I take my concealed carry gun and then shoot the person who's now robbed me? Well, to the extent that uh, you know you're you again reasonable basis of fear and you know sort of self defense. Uh, sure. Right, because there hasn't now. I only know this from like watching Law and Order, so I so I, I apologize. But 
the self-defense, if the person's fleeing my house and I shoot him in the back, I'm how much danger am I in if the person's leaving my house and I shoot him in the back, which is sort of similar to this to this case, is the homeowner, and I know the are uh, the castle doctrines out there, but the, the, can the homeowner claim self-defense if the perpetrator is running away? Well, again, that gets to state law issues. It has nothing to do with, you know, police and the Fourth Amendment. Right. Um, no expert on this. Uh, ask my criminal law colleagues on that one. Yeah, all right, good. Uh, professor Roger Goldman, Professor Emeritus, St. Louis University School of, of Law. Um, anything else we should know? Anything else you've been thinking of that, that you wanted to touch on? No, just uh, I think uh, your audience does just need to uh, realize that this is incredibly complex, that we can have both the state and the federal government involved on this, and uh, let's wait to see what happens as, as facts develop. My fear is that um, we're not going to know all the facts, and the facts are going to, we're going to get so tied down into his left arm was above the the rear view mirror, which meant this, and it was, you know, we're going to get into such minutia on this that I think the fact of a split second decision by a police officer is going to get lost in all that. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, these are incredibly difficult cases because of the primary uh, witness to it is dead. Same thing happened in the Trevin Martin case. Right. Uh, and I should say one other thing. These cases, if it does get to federal court and a federal criminal prosecution, these are hard cases to win. We haven't even talked about who's going to be on the jury. What's the racial composition of the jury likely to be if it was in state court and federal court? Um, the defense lawyers, when they're arguing, you can bet that closing argument could be something like, look, do you want to, as you've been I indicating, to hold uh, police to these impossibly difficult standards. If you do so, crime, you know, police won't try to prosecute crime. So, uh, again, this is a, just the beginning of what's going to amount to a very long story. Uh, Professor uh, Roger Goldman, uh, thank you very much for coming in. Great stuff. My pleasure. Professor Emeritus, St. Louis University School of Law.